Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, this has been, I think, uh, a great program of talks that you guys have been putting together over um, while well, we've all been in lockdown around the world. So, you know, I really thank you for that. It's been sort of great to see and one of the really nice outcomes of being stuck at home in COVID. I would normally be excavating at Drimelon at this time of year. Um, two days ago, we were scheduled to start the Drimelon Field School, but um, I'm now still here in Australia. So the first Melbourne winter that I've actually had to endure since living here. So... Um, so today I am going to talk to you about two sites. One is Drimelin Cave, which we published in Science recently, um, that I've been working at since about 2010. And then the site of Amanzi Springs, which is another excavation I run, which is an Acheulean site um, in South Africa. And I've been working there since about 2015. Um, this is a major collaboration with the Paleo Research Institute at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa and at both these sites who support us tremendously for being in country. So this just gives you a bit of an overview of the two sites. Um, so we're very lucky to have Australian Research Council funding for both sites at the moment and National Geographic also gave us some money last year to work at Amanzi. So I'm going to talk about Drimelin first because it's the older site and it sets the earlier scene for human evolution and then we'll sort of switch to Amanzi Springs which then sort of covers a period where we're looking at the transition through to modern humans and the transition from the Acheulean to the Middle Stone Age. We haven't really published very much from Amanzi Springs yet, but we've got a number of papers in traction for that. So to give people an idea of where we are in the world, so almost everything that we know about human evolution prior to about 1.1 million years ago in South Africa comes from a very small area just outside of Johannesburg. It's only about 25 kilometers by about 10 kilometers wide. It has huge numbers of sites, famous sites like Stokefontein and Swartkrans, obviously well-known recent discoveries like Rising Star and Malapa. And then you have two sat sort of satellite sites, the Makapanscha area further to the north, and then Taung, where the original Australopithecus africana skull was found back in 1924. Um, so we have a very concentrated view of human evolution, but it's a very, very rich record. Um, and then you can see Amanzi Springs down there, sort of on the southern Cape Coast, so in quite a different area. Um, the sites in the cradle, or as it's, as it's termed locally, I'm never a great fan of the term, but the Cradle of Humankind, um, UNESCO World Heritage Area, they are caves, but you wouldn't recognize them as caves today. Basically, most of them are holes in the ground that have been partly mined. They are caves that have been completely infilled with sediment, They've been hardened into a rock, and then they've been, the, the, the top part of them has normally been eroded away, and then they've been excavated by lime miners in the late 19th and 20th century, removing speleothem for use in the gold extraction process, and then a number of them have been excavated for coming up for 100 years at this point. Um, so a very long period of excavation. So... 
I started in South Africa in 1997. Um, when I started in South Africa, there were not really very many. Uh, we didn't have good ages for a lot of the sites. We didn't have very uh, good radiometric ages in particular. One of the challenges for dating uh, sites in South Africa is that we don't have volcanic material like in Eastern Africa. In Eastern Africa, you can, as it shows here in the slide, uh, date your volcanic layers using um, argon argon and pair that up with things like paleomagnetism to look across vast parts of the landscape and put all of your um, fossils into a nice chronological model. In South Africa, we have two problems. One is that we have no volcanic material, um, so we can't use argon-argon, and we've had to use other methods. And also the stratigraphy is not linked across the landscape between sites because they are separate caves. So a lot of the last 23 years that I've spent in South Africa has been dealing with this question of how do we date the sites? How do we correlate the sites with each other and the fossils with each other? And then how can we correlate that with the rest of the world, particularly the East African record, which is in many ways quite different to South Africa. So we sort of began, we put a big synthesis of this together. So myself and Robin Pickering um, on the uranium lead dating of speleothems, these flowstones that occur in all of the cave caves. We published that in Nature last year. And for the first time, we were able to show that these flowstone layers formed in different caves at exactly the same time, which means for the first time, we can actually begin to link caves across the landscape. We can begin to use the flowstones a little bit like you do volcanic tufts in East Africa. So we can start saying that these ones are above and below these tufts. We can start sandwiching um, the fossils between them. So that's a sort of really big step forward. It's not the end of the story because we still have to date the layers that the actual fossils are in. And that's the bit that we're sort of um, doing a lot more work on now following on from this. Ultimately, our sort of game plan as we move along, and we're already beginning to sort of piece this all together, is that we use the uranium lead dating the speleothem layers that sandwich the fossil units. We're using um, uranium series electron spin resonance dating to directly date the fossils themselves. Now that often has quite large errors on it, but when we combine it with the uranium lead and the paleomagnetism together, it can give us a comprehensive picture of understanding uh, what each of the different parts of the caves um, date to. So the Fossils themselves often date the breccia deposits in the cave, the paleomag, the fine grain material, and the uranium lead um, dates the speleothem. And so we're dating all different components of the cave and bringing this all together. Now, hopefully, when we do that, it all tells us the same answer. Um, that doesn't happen all of the time. Anyone that's ever read a, date, uh, a dating paper on Sturckfontein will know how difficult it is to make different dates um, say the same thing. But at a number of sites now, we're actually beginning to get good dates. We're beginning to understand how best to sample the sites to get good chronological data out of it. And for many, many years, I was very much just a lab person that came and took samples and went and did the paleomag and then came back. But um, around about 2013, I decided that I sort of wanted to move out of that and get back to sort of doing field archaeology and running projects myself. So this is sort of an overview, of generalized overview of human evolution. Um, so the ones that are in red are the ones that have been suggested to occur in South Africa. Um, the ones in black from various other parts of um, Africa or the world. So we don't, um, we, in, I've put a, a question mark next to Homo habilis and a question mark next to Homo agaster. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later because the designation of Homo in South Africa has been rather problematic. But what you can see to begin with is firstly that the South African record starts later than the East African record. We don't have hominid material earlier than three million years. And this is a really interesting question about why is that the case? Do we simply not have hominids in Southern Africa at this time period? 
or is it a geological bias that means we're missing that part of the record? And this is sort of something that I've been working on to try and understand um, over the last sort of several years or so. Um, the period that I'm particularly interested in is this period around 2 million years, which is the period that Drimelin dates to, where we see the last occurrence of Oscopithecus africanus um, with Oscopithecus sediba, which some people consider to be a very separate species, others perhaps a late occurring um, Oscopithecus africanus, and then the beginning suddenly on the landscape of Paranthropus robustus and Homo. And often it's termed early Homo because it's been um, quite confusing as to what species it represents. And then, of course, very, very recently, we got the discovery of Homo naledi, which everybody initially thought was going to be quite early, but turned out to be extremely late, only two, three hundred thousand years old, and thus potentially overlapping with Homo sapiens. So um, that adds another interesting question into the mix of where does Homo naledi come from? What is its origins? Now, what we have known for quite a long time, the work of Elizabeth Verber in the 1970s very much showed that there was some form of turnover in the fossil record um, in South Africa, but we didn't really know when that happened, what the timing of it was. Um, prior to actually getting a lot of good dates for South Africa, I think people thought that it was probably around two and a half million years ago because that was the same sort of time period people were talking about climatic shifts occurring in Eastern Africa and Australopithecus last being seen in um, Eastern Africa. What we now know is that this sort of shift seems to occur quite later. So Australopithecus occurs down to perhaps as late as 2.1 million years. So there is a flowstone lying over the top of the Mrs. Ples Oslopithecus africana skull there in the middle that dates to around about 2.07 million. We certainly know that Oslopithecus lasts after 2.3 million years. And then, of course, we've got um, Sediba itself at Malapa down to 1.98. Um, then suddenly, and it always seems very a very sudden occurrence, we get the occurrence of Paranthropus robustus, at sites like Swakrans, and we get the occurrence of material that has been designated as Homo. We see the first stone tools, we see the first bone tools occurring on the landscape. And this switch seems to happen quite um, quickly. Obviously, we also have amazing fossils like uh, the Littlefoot fossil. One of the things about digging in caves is we can find these beautiful um, partial skeletons on the record. What we don't have a very good record of at the moment is really a good environmental record to put this against. But there are indicators in some environmental records of significant shifts in southern Africa around about 2.2 million years when this, when the dates now suggest this transition is taking place. But the question of Homo has always been a very interesting one because if you look at fossils, they're fragmentary. So we look at things like STW53 from Sturkfontein there on the top right on the left hand side or SK847 on the right hand side. These have been called many different things. STW53 has been called Homo habilis, it's been called Oslopithecus uh, africanus, um, SK847 has been called Paranthropus, it's been called Homo agaster. There hasn't been a definitive view on what exactly these are, and partly that's the fragmentary nature of the record. So one of the things that we obviously are interested in looking at is also this question of, you know, why, why are we seeing this shift taking place? Why is Oslopithecus africanus sort of going from the record? And we got some interesting insights into that recently. We published this other paper in Nature where we looked at uh, certain elements, lithium, calcium, and barium in the teeth of Oslopithecus africanus. And it, it appeared that these these sort of um, the, the, uh, the younger specimens that we have from the record in South Africa seem to be under some form of seasonal dietary stress and in actual fact seem to be resorting to going back to breastfeeding in a sort of cyclical manner. So we can see this, the sort of banding in the teeth shows that they're actually going back and relying on breastfeeding during certain periods of the year, which is another, and this is another just amazing way that we can do, you can, I can dream of doing this sort of stuff when I was studying at university, that we can get this sort of information to understand the sorts of dietary pressures that these species that then go extinct may have been under. And we're doing some more work on this. Um, I've got some fossils to continue this work. They're just stuck in South Africa at the moment. I can't get to them. But um, 
So that sort of dream, that brings us to sort of Drimlin itself, just to sort of set up the scene of what we're looking for. And in actual fact, um, Drimlin was found originally in 1994 by um, a chap called Andre Kayser, who unfortunately has passed away now. And he excavated at the site for many, many years. Um, Almost all the hominid material has come from what we call DMQ, or the main quarry, which is that one on the right-hand side. So this is a large single cavern that has been quite seriously excavated out by these early lime miners. But there's actually one sort of section in there that is still completely intact, which is the area we now excavate and been working on. A number of years ago, in about 2013, um, we sort of climbed down this tiny little hole about 50 meters to the west um, and we found these very very dense patches of fossils in what we now call DMK or the Macondo. We then used ground penetrating radar to try and sort of see how big and expanse the sort of fossil unit may have been underneath that deposit and we slowly excavated it out over three or four years. We now know the Macondo is about 2.6 million years old, it doesn't have hominids, but what it does give us is within close proximity, we've got a site that we know is sort of prior to this transition in the record and one that's occur at, is sort of at this transition in the record. If we were to find hominids at Macondo, we would expect them to be Australopithecus africanus most likely. But we can look at the other species and we can actually look at some of the transitions that are going on. And that's a really nice feature of the site now that we have these very distinctly different dated um, deposits. This just gives you an idea. This is DMK. This is the older 2.6, 1 million year old site. And that gives you a real sense of this is, this one has been really heavily eroded. Um, and there's just um, sort of right in the center there. Um, oops, right in the center there is where the sort of main fossil bearing unit is. Um, it contains sort of species that are distinctly different from the main quarry. We get Parapapio rather than Papio. Uh, certain extinct sewids that are found at early sites like the Makapans Khat Limeworks. And we've been using things like cosmogenics to help us understand that we've probably lost about 26 meters of rock and deposit over the top of this over about the last 2.6 million years. Um, so that gives you an idea of sort of the, the remnants that sort of we're looking at to these things. And that makes it very difficult um, to reconstruct how do these sites actually relate to each other? Were they once part of one very big cave system that has been eroded? Were they separate caves? And so we've been doing lots of stratigraphic work, micromorphology, to try and understand and reconstruct that sort of work. DMK, DMQ, the main quarry, which is what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Probably um, Drimelin, um, not very well published site, to be honest. It's got a very rich hominid record. It has been excavated for a long time, but um, not a lot of publications from it. Um, DNH7, the female Paranthropus robustus skull, the most complete Paranthropus robustus skull sort of found to date, was found very early on in excavations. Um, and it actually comes from where the red dot is. So this is actually from a block of sediment that's actually collapsed off the main part of the cave. So back there on the right hand side is the rear wall of the cave where the main in situ deposits are and DNH7 actually comes from a, a collapsed block off that. But after they found this cranium, really the vast majority of other hominid material was mostly isolated teeth. Um, and that sort of got me interested as a sort of more geological bent person as to why that was and if we excavated in different areas might we find different things. Um, so we have Paranthropus robustus, we, we knew that we had Homo from the teeth, but we also have some stone tools, not very many, there's only six of them in total, not very many stone tools for some reason. But then we do have these bone tools and we have over a hundred of these now. Um, so I had a PhD student work on these and she worked through them and identified you know, a series of these she thinks are definitive bone tools. They're not manufactured bone tools. They are rounded through use. Um, quite what the use is, is an open matter for debate, but it's been most often suggested that they were used for digging open termite mounds or something like that. I'm not going to stake my reputation on exactly what they were used for, but it is a very interesting and unique part of the South African record because we don't see this um, in other places. We see it at Swartkrans, um, Cromdry, um, so 
there is a record of it in South Africa. If we look at the entire hominid collection to date, we now have over 155 hominid specimens, and this is this is what it looked like a few years ago. Um, we had the DNA7 cranium, but the vast majority of material was isolated teeth or uh, little bits of uh, mandible or maxilla, mostly found in, during the excavations between 1994 and 2007 when the site was excavated almost continuously. Um, and I had a student working on this material for many, many years, for a number of years. She's just submitted, is about to put her corrections in soon. We do also get um, another interesting aspect of the site is we get a lot of juvenile specimens. So there was a paper published by Tanya Smith in 2015 in PLOS One, where they used synchrotron analysis to look at the age of death of these individuals and showed that we had specimens as young as half a year old to about 5.5 years, which is a very interesting part um, of the assemblage that we're still sort of looking at and trying to understand the specifics of the taphonomy that uh, means that we have these younger individuals. So one of the things, as the sort of as I say, as a more geological bent that I was interested in was, is this a preservation of um, you know teeth and just isolated teeth? Is this a true pattern of preservation at the site? Is that was what is that was what was being accumulated at the site, or is it a is it a fossil preservation? Is it to the fact that? In actual fact, there would have been more material there, but perhaps it's, um, it hasn't survived for some reason. Um, you know, if you go to certainly working in southern China, you often only find the crowns of teeth pre uh, preserving because of the very acidic nature of some of the soils and sediments there. So um, where they'd excavated previously for many, many years in the central part of the site is actually an area of collapse. Um, so a lot of that material is actually ex situ. And my worry was that sort of it was being decalcified and eroded and we were losing a lot of the more complete material. And in actual fact, when we started excavating Drimaluma Condo, which is on there on the right, that's one of my students, Rhiannon, sitting there digging in the middle. If you look on the top right-hand side, all of the red dots show where the fossils come from. So these little circular features are what are known locally as Macondos. And what they are is that where we've had tree roots come down into the deposits, the, um, the, the uh, Pellier cave deposits themselves are easier to dissolve than the dolomite rock that surround them. And so the roots work their way down to the caves that still, still exist underneath and they decalcify all of the sediment. So in some cases, what's in these Macondos is just decalcified um, sort of breccia that was originally in situ. In some cases, they fall through into the lower caves and then they get refilled with um, colluvium later. But what it was beginning to show us is that we were not getting no fossils really in the middle of these features. It was all occurring around the edges. And so it was this question of, are we losing fossil material? Is it being dissolved away and destroyed through this sort of active process? So we started excavating very, very differently. We started excavating in very specific areas where we thought, okay, well, if that is the case, then we might start finding more complete remains. Um, and hey presto, in sort of 2018, we had the, um, well, sort of uh, one of the richest seasons that we'd ever really had at the site. Um, and this was partly brought on by the discovery of the, the sort of DNH 134 Homo erectus cranium as well, because that really sort of set off, you know, we can find these more complete crania. Um, and we do have more complete cranium of other things like baboons. But so this is something we would actually be excavating at this exact point, but we can't get to South Africa. Um, so this is the DNH 153. It appears to be at least a partial skeleton. How much of a skeleton at this point, we don't really know. We found it very late on in 2018 and we found more of it in 2019. There's more of it to come, but it's in quite a solidified area of the site. And this is going to be a main focus for us over the years ahead is to see how this but certainly we've got what look like ribs um we've got finger bones there's a little bit of a maxilla coming out of that so that's sort of we don't know what species it is yet but um that's going to be an exciting find for the future um one that we're working on at the moment um dnh 155 is a paranthropus robustus cranium we found in 2018 so this was found by 
our fields, one of our field school students from Canada, Samantha Good, on her very first ever excavation <laughs> in Africa. She finds this um, relatively complete Paranthropus robustus cranium. Um, so you can see on the top left there, that's the teeth, so that's the maxilla as she found it upside down. The skull was upside down. You can see it down there in the bottom. Hominid skulls coming out of Drimelin do not look anything like hominid skulls when they're in the ground. They just look like clods of dirt, basically, until they get out. And then my PhD student, Jesse Martin, is um, extremely skilled in uh, excavating these things and putting them back together again. You can see him there. We took the block out and then he excavated it back at the field base. And you can see sort of one side of the cranium coming out. So uh, hopefully we'll have a paper coming out, out on that in the not too distant future. Um, some of the other material that we published in the science paper, um, there's DNH 152, which is called the Ketty skull. Uh, it's named after the landowner at the site who came and excavated with us um, in 2018, which was really, really nice. Um, and that was found, the first piece was found by him, and then it was found by another couple of uh, students, Amber Yeager um, and Eunice, uh, who are now both starting their PhDs at Arizona State University, which is sort of nice to see. So we published this cranium um, along with the DNH 134 sort of Homo erectus cranium in science recently. Um, and it's another sort of partial um, Paranthropus robustus cranium. Uh, we did this, this one is a little bit more fragmentary than the other one. And then, of course, we've got DNH 134 itself, which is nicknamed Simon, um, after our colleague who unfortunately recently died of cancer. Simon uh, had worked at uh, the Drimelin site pretty, pretty much from the very, very beginning um, and was just sort of an excellent, um, you know, preparator and excavator and is sorely, sorely missed. But um, his name will live on sort of in this, in this cranium. So... This is uh, when we excavated it. It was found by a second, year, uh, a second year undergrad student at La Trobe, Richard Curtis, in 2015. Again, his first ever excavation in Africa, and he pulls this out. Um, that's him actually excavating the cranium, which at that point uh, he still thought was a baboon, uh, because we all thought it was a baboon to begin with, because it was in so many pieces and it was so thin it didn't automatically strike us that this was uh, a hominid cranium. But as my colleague Stephanie Baker started putting the thing back together again, um, we could sort of at sight, we could begin to see the cranium getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like, well, that's not a baboon. Um, and then when Jesse and Angie then sort of fully reconstructed it back at the lab, we began to sort of see, oh, actually, this is not a baboon and this is not Paranthropus. So, that was, a, that was a big thing because finding homo material in South Africa is uh, exceedingly rare. And certainly finding cranial vaults is very difficult because one of the things that's great about Drimelin is that we often find it in lots of pieces, but we can put the pieces back together again. Whereas a lot of other sites like Swartkrans, that material is found in hard breccia. So that material is often squashed by rocks. The crania have been sort of pancaked. Um, and you can't pull those apart and put them back together again. They are just as they are. So that's one of the really nice things about Dremelin is we can often take all the bits and put them back together. Um, so it's reconstructed as being between a 1.5 to 3-year-old individual, so quite young. Um, we, in the paper, refer to it as Homo affinities erectus because it has very uh, all of the sort of um, traits to do with shape show that it links with Homo erectus, but it is still a young and small individual. As far as working out how old it is, um, this is our, um, this is one of our um, photogrammetry uh, models of the site. So this consists of about 6,000 photos that have been stitched together by one of my PhD students um, to create this 3D model. Um, and you can, this is basically looking against the west wall of the cave where we have the in-situ deposits. So we've used a combination of dating methods to date the site. So we used uranium lead, which was initially published in that big sort of um, the big nature paper. And that dates the base of speleothem to about 2.7 million years. Um, and then there's a capping speleothem at about 1.8. Um, but the basal speleothem formed a long time before any sediments were deposited into the site. Um,
Um, and the capping speleothem forms uh, quite a bit later. There's a big erosional phase before that forms. Now, where we sort of um, got very, very lucky with regards to the dating is that in one of the sections, there's a very, very, very thin flowstone. Um, and in actual fact, Robin Pickering, who dated it, had never, I don't think she'd dated anything quite that thin before using uranium lead. Um, and she got a date of about 1.96 million years for that flowstone. Um, that had an age um, uncertainty of about 100, uh, plus or minus 120,000 years. Um, so that's still quite a big sort of error range. But when we were then doing the uh, paleomagnetism, what we found is that that flowstone actually forms in the middle of a geomagnetic field reversal. So this was done as an honours um, PhD project, uh, an honours project initially, and you can actually see the magnetic field sort of like uh, reversing itself through the section. Um, we've slowly sort of done more and more work um, beyond what is actually published to date. And we can actually see this magnetic reversal sort of across the site. So we can sort of see the layer um, where the reversal occurs. All of the hominid material that we, that, that all those uh, complete crania that we talked about all come from below that reversal. So based on um, the uranium lead date um, and also a uranium series ESR date of around 1.965 million years that comes from just under this flowstone, we can then construct that all together to show ultimately that this reversal is the base of the old device subcron at about 1.95 million years. Um, so we know that everything must be older than that reversal. The question then is, well, how much older could the deposits be than that? Because the basal age is about 2.7, as I say. So we have another uranium series electron spin resonance date right next to the DNH-134 cranium that comes out at about 2.041 million years. Now that does have um, quite a significant plus or minus error on it. So it is possible that the um, the age could be significantly older than that, but the other ESR median age is very, very similar to the age that we get for the reversal. So we think it's probably about that. And we don't see any older, small magnetic reversals in the sequence. So um, our best estimate at the moment is that it's uh, the bottom of the sequence is not much older than 2.04, probably not older than 2.07 million years at the moment. So this just sort of shows, this is just a picture of the same sort of shot of the site showing that rough location of that 1.95 million year reversal. This was the first time we actually found a reversal in South Africa really in sediments, mostly when we found them they've been within speleothem. So that was sort of another interesting component to it. Um, and you can see all of that material is sort of there below um, that reversal sort of um, section. We don't actually have a lot of material surviving above that in actual fact. So the vast majority of the collection is probably older than that. So, so to summarize, dated to around 2.04 to 1.95 million by these three methods. So currently contains the oldest definitive, Prianthropus robustus and early Homo in South Africa. I say definitive because there are other sites that um, once they, um, you know, if they get um, more constrained ages could be older. Uh, Swartkrans having remnant, I think, is probably younger, but there may be parts of Swartkrans like Lower Bank, which could be older. Um, Crom Dry, you know, they're doing some excellent work there where they're finding older units that could be as old um, as at Drimelin. I really look forward to seeing what sort of comes out of there in the future. We also have over 100 bone tools, um, which again, sort of the oldest in the world, other, unless some of those other sites end up being slightly older, and a very, very small connection of stone tools. And I'm not entirely sure why we have so few. Um, I don't know if it's because the previous excavators um, knew more about fossils than they did stone tools, but <laughs> hopefully not. But it is in a very odd part of the landscape, and a lot of the sites that we find stone tools tend to be down in the river valleys um, near to the gravels. So maybe there's that's something to do with where these things are occurring on the landscape so it's not just um if we look at the fauna so we sort of look at um uh not just at the hominid transitions from australopithecus through but if we look at the faunal material we also have a very interesting sort of mixed collection of material at the site so we have the last occurrence of certain carnivore taxa like dinophilus barlowi 
Um, and Lysanop silverbergi, this is the last time they occur in the record, and these appear to be, you know, very much endemic South African forms. But overlapping with that, we also have Dinophilus pivotoi, which is another false saber tooth. Um, cat that's seen from Drimelin and younger, and at the moment it's the first occurrence of that. And this is the first time the two species are actually found to overlap at the same site. So, again, there's evidence evidence of sort of transitions going on. We have at sites prior to Drimelin, we have um, species such as Gazella van Hopenai that then seems to disappear, and we then begin to see Antidorcus reci, which is known earlier in East Africa, but is known, suddenly occurs on the landscape in South Africa at this time, which those two probably shared a similar sort of niche and one may have replaced the other. Um, and so everything to me sort of points to this idea that we're getting an extinction of certain endemic forms and we're getting forms moving into South Africa at this time period. And we're getting a bit of a mix for a while and then certain specimens are going extinct and, and being replaced. Um, so with the dating now, we're beginning to be able to resolve these sorts of questions in far more detail than um, Elizabeth Verber was able to do um, when she was excavating this stuff in, and doing her PhD in the 70s. The other very interesting thing about it, obviously, is also this points to the fact that we've got multiple taxa on the landscape at roughly the same period. We've got um, Paranthropus and um, Homo affinities erectus at Drimelin itself. And then about sort of six kilometers away at Malapa, at exactly the same time period, we have the last occurring Australopithecus in Australopithecus sediba. It would be very cool to find sediba at Dribblin itself. It's something I hope for every season, um, rather than just correlating across different sites at the same time period. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean they met each other on the landscape. Um, they may have been there at different seasonal periods. They may have been there at slightly different time periods. It's a very small area, but they were obviously all coming through there during this period of time, which um, opens up interesting questions about, you know, did they interact? Um, what type of interaction may that have been? Um, is the sort of competition for resources in the landscape something that pushed Australopithecus sort of over the edge to extinction, etc.? So, I mean, part of this depends on your view of Australopithecus sediba, whether you see it as a potential, um, it's been suggested as an ancestor to Homo and specifically Homo erectus, but now we have something that is, uh, we would argue is Homo erectus on the landscape at the same time, which makes that a little bit more untenable unless you do find earlier specimens of Australopithecus sediba, but there is a very rich record just prior to Dremel at Stokefontein where that hasn't been noted today. It doesn't mean it won't be, but... Um, another interesting question for the future. As far as sort of how the cranium fits into um, the story of Erectus overall, there's not a lot of comparisons for a 1.5 to 3 year old Homo erectus. I mean, that's one of the problems um, of such a young cranium. There is the Mordricurto cranium from Indonesia. It's, it's thought to be a little bit older, maybe two to four years old. Um, Mojokerto has a cranial capacity of about 630 cc, DNH 538, so it's a little lower, but it's a bit younger. But they're very similar in overall shape and form. Um, and then also, you know, if you begin to compare our very young cranium with things like the very recently published Dan 5 P1 cranium from Eastern Africa, that only has a cranial capacity of 598 as what is reconstructed as an adult female. Um, so there is very much, you know, this could be seen sort of, it's not that, um, out, and, and 538 is a sort of median estimate. It could be, it could be higher, it could be lower. And we hope we're going to be doing some more work on that in future publications. But um, it sort of fits within this sort of potential very early, what we might expect to see as a very early Homo erectus, you know, 200,000 years earlier than the material, say, at Dominici. And if we look at this as sort of a global sort of picture, looking at Erectus and this question of um, movement and, you know, we often always talk, we talk a lot about out of Africa and Dominici being the first sort of examples of um, Homo Erectus outside of Africa. Um, but, um, you know, there's also, there's also a question of what's happening in Africa. We do have to always remember that there is a huge 
biological, there's a huge geological bias to the African record. We've got a lot of stuff from the East African Rift Valley. We've got a lot of stuff from a very small area of South Africa. But what about the rest of Africa? You know, this huge swathe of Africa that we don't know very much about this early time period. And that's why, you know, we very specifically didn't say just because we think we have the oldest Homo erectus in South Africa, that that's where its origin was. In actual fact, if anything, to me, it looks like that these taxa may be Paranthropus and Homo erectus were actually moving into Southern Africa from somewhere else in Africa, perhaps not East Africa, but somewhere else as to be sort of determined. And I think this fits nicely with the story that's beginning to emerge. I mean, we know that we have Homo erectus at Dominici, perhaps by earlier than 1.83 million years. But there's also those recently dis, uh, suggested stone tools from China, somewhere between 2.14 and about 1.98 million years. And it was suggested when that was published that perhaps this was an earlier species that had moved out of Africa, but maybe not. If we've got Erectus in South Africa at Drimelin at this same time period as there, perhaps this is part of all of these movements and it's moving into Southern Africa at the same time it finds its way um, through and out of China. So that's our sort of working viewpoint um, on Drimelin and the sort of record at the moment. Um, uh, just got a couple of, I'm going to move on from here to um, uh, Amanzi, but I, I've, I've, there's a question. So could you talk about the technology with regards to the bone tools and if there are any studies on the ways it was utilized? Um, so, I mean, I can touch on that sort of very briefly. Um, I mean, ultimately, um, the, the work that we have done on the bone tools is that we were trying to identify specific taphonomic signatures. So we took, um, what, what had sort of happened is that excavations over the years had put all odd rounded bits of bone into a box. And so we systematically went through that material. Um, and obviously Bob Brain published uh, bone tools at Swart Crans previously. So we used that very much as a comparison. And we found um, certain bits of bone that are just simple rounding to it and there was no evidence of real striation patterns or anything on the actual tips of the material but there was a group of bone tools um, or a group of rounded bones that had this very uh, specific type of groove um, um, patterns and it was very concentrated on the tip of the bones and so those are the ones that we've sort of um, tentatively identified as being bone tools from the site. We have done some experimental studies looking at, you know, some of the same old questions of whether used as sort of digging sticks. Do they have the same, those sorts of um, striations that you might get from that? Mostly the striations sort of suggest some form of contact with dirt or other. I mean, it's a bit difficult. Um, we work, we are trying to work some more on it, but um, it, I think it's a difficult challenge with that material. It's modified through some form of use, but. Um, cave, um, occupation of the cave as well. So that's another thing. We've, we've also been, I mean, I think that's another question. Um, the question of whether the hominids use the cave sites in South Africa for habitation has flipped backwards and forwards over time, very much so. Um, we certainly do have taphonomic markers at some of the sites that suggest carnivore accumulations. I mean, there's very clear um, teeth marks through some of the crania. So we know that at least some of the material is being accumulated by carnivores. The uh, occurrence of lots of juvenile specimens has raised some interesting questions about were early humans um, living in the caves um, basically the same way baboons live in the caves today. So because it's about 1700 meters there, it's quite cold during the winter and I'm sure, and or it is today, it's freezing when we excavate there at Drimelin sometimes. And baboons we know do use the caves to sleep in to help um, thermal regula regulation of um, uh, their bodies during the winter period. Sometimes they're just in the entrances, sometimes they come into the caves. And we have studied some caves in the regions that do have baboons living in there to try and understand the sorts of taphonomic patterns that we might expect to see if that were the case. We haven't really um, 
the, the, the sort of fossil collections from the site are massive and we haven't got through them all with regards to phonomy. We've been working on very much looking at the species material at the moment. So um, that's a sort of another question for the future. I think it's a very, I think it's a problematic thing when people often say, this is a leopard site, this is a hyena accumulation. These sites are probably uh, accumulated by lots of different mechanisms over the, the period that they're infilling. And I think we have to look at a more complex argument than perhaps what had been put out before. Um, Andy, maybe you can take the questions at the end. Yeah, the that's talk. fine. I'll move that's on to yeah. I'll move on to Amanzi now. So, um, so that's Dremelin. Um, let's see with the next thing. So. Amanzi Springs, um, so we're sort of moving uh, about 1.5 million years um, younger in time. So I spend a lot of my time working on not dating just hominids, but dating the earlier Stone Age. Um, we don't have a very good older one record for South Africa, but we've got a very rich Acheulean record. The problem remains, it's not very well dated. A lot of it comes from poor context, often from surface accumulations. We don't have a very great a geographic understanding across all of Southern Africa. There's lots of sites up near Johannesburg, lots down near Cape Town, and quite a few around Kimberley. Amanzi, as you can see, is in the Eastern Cape on the Southern Cape coast, sits in a very different area of the country, which is something that interested us. Um, and I find it amazing, to be honest, that Amanzi Springs, we're the first people to look at Amanzi Springs in 50 years. Um, it was originally excavated by Hilary Deacon as a master's project um, back in the 1960s. And it showed that there was stratified Acheulean in association with wood. And yet um, no one went back for 50 years. Um, and I always wanted to go there. It took us a long time to get sort of work out who owned the site and get permission. Um, but we got back there in 2015. Um, and it's, you know, it's a period, obviously, uh, you can see me, that's me when I had long hair up on the top right with a, one of the biggest hand axes I think I've ever been, um, uh, ever found, which was actually up near Kimberley. Um, but we don't have a very good hominid record for this time period either. Uh, the Alansfontaine cranium, which comes from, or Soldana skull, which comes from sort of north of Cape Town, is one of the few crania that we have from South Africa during the sort of Acheulean period. Um, but with Amanzi, that we would expect something like the Saholdan skull would be sort of around at the period that it was being accumulated. So this sort of just zooms in, as I say, it was excavated initially by Rains, keeping 63, Hilary Deacon for his masters in 64 through to 66. Really the only sort of major publication was in Deacon 1970, which was this um, Annals of the Cape uh, Provincial Museum, um, which is getting more and more difficult to get hold of, but that's sort of the definitive work other than Deacon's um, uh, thesis. And there was no real subsequent work. It was sometimes included in some people's studies, but not a lot. It's, you know, in the Albany Museum, it's quite a long way from where people often go when they're researching in South Africa. Um, it's around about 20 kilometers uh, from the sea, which is also sort of an interesting thing about it being a more sort of coastal site. And it occurs just on the edge of a hill. And there's a series of about 11 spring deposits, all of which have archaeology in there. And it's in quite sort of densely vegetated area. Um, so this is our, this sort of just shows our drone scan of the area. So Hillary Deacon, uh, well, Henry Deacon excavated in area one and area two um, for his thesis. And then area seven is a new site that we've been excavating, which is the first time it's been excavated. So at the moment we're, uh, we're focusing on these three spring eyes, but there's about 11 in total that hopefully we'll get around to sort of one day. So I'm just going to sort of run through these sort of one by one. So this is sort of a photo of what the site looks like. So this is from the 1964 survey of area one. Um, and you can see the number of hand axes that were just sort of picked up off the surface. So this was actually an area which was the origin of the citrus industry in South Africa. And so they actually dug out some of these spring eyes and used them, um, used them as um, irrigation um, dams. And so a lot of the material had sort of been scraped out and that's where a lot of these exit you hand axes came from. So that gives you an idea of what it looked in 64. Um, that, the red square is where they excavated. And then that's a picture from 2015 when we went on our first survey. 
Um, so none of the none of the excavations were filled back in, so it was very easy to refine the original excavations and identify where they were. There'd been a lot of collapse that we sort of had to deal with. It's a lot more vegetation at the site now than there was back then, um, which was soon after it had been used as a dam. And then this sort of is another shot showing the excavations in progress at Area 1 in the 60s um, versus that's what it looked like in 2015 when we found it. So there were little bits of uh, some witness sections still standing at that point, but we were able to re-identify a lot of the stratigraphy that was exposed relatively easily. So that was, that was a nice sort of part of it. Um, it did take us a number of years to then re-excavate. So we systematically went and re-excavated all the infill from his original excavations. We did um, photogrammetry scans of the site so that we could begin to sort of paste together um, what had sort of fallen in and where the exact layers were that he'd identified. Um, so you can see me there standing in his deep sounding and the, you can see the layers that the archaeology occurs in is this sort of band through the middle. And in the bottom right hand side, you can see our mo photogrammetry model laid over the top of his section model. Um, his datum was missing, but we were very lucky that in actual fact, you can see it just in front of me there, there's an old nail of his that we still found in situ. And we found actually a couple that were in his monograph that we, that we could still see in situ. And we used that basically to tie our grid back into his grid um, and work out where we were, what layers were which, and what had fallen in and, and, and collapsed, etc. cetera. Um, that's just showing some of the photogrammetry models and our open, sort of opening up of the excavations. Um, and we were able to go back to sites, certain bits, like in cutting one here, um, you can see his stratigraphic drawing up on the top right, um, cutting one extension, that's the cutting one extension. And so we're able to find the layer that is the wood layer, which is basically that sort of brownish layer in the middle. It's got the wood and the Shulian artifacts in it. That's where we've banged in an OSL uh, sample tube, and we get a date of about 400,000 years for that. So we've done a comprehensive dating program using TTOSL combined with PIIRSL, so dating both the quartz and the feldspar fractions. And this was the big question we had to go back to the site. We know that we've got a shulian there. We know it's in stratified context. Can we date it? Um, as it turns out, it's actually a bit young for doing paleomag, so my specialty was out the window. So um, Lee Arnold, who's at the University of Adelaide, came in and uh, produced a series. We now have about 28 ages um, for the site, um, which are a beautiful series of ages showing TTOSL and PRSL um, saying the same thing, all in nice stratigraphic sequence. So we've determined we can date the site. We've got wood preservation. We've got a Shulian. Um, so now we've got another four more years of funding to uh, find out what more we can uh, explore here. So that just gives you an example of one of the luminescence sort of dates. So that's the sort of ages that we're getting. So the TTOSL age, you can see 398.7 plus or minus about 31.6 thousand. And the PIRSL 4.03.9 plus or minus 23.4. So very close to each other, dating those two fractions, which gives us great confidence that the ages are correct. Um, some of the other things is re-looking at the stratigraphy itself and the sort of archaeology layer in a specific band. Um, what he's got labelled there is his artefact zone um, in the middle. And in actual fact, we, we found that there were some differences to the way we could reconstruct the stratigraphy, certainly after doing the micromorphology. We found a certain number of erosional contacts that he hadn't identified, which appeared to be at the base of where the archaeology zone is. So we the reason that there's this lower zone with no archaeology and then archaeology zone is actually because there's an erosional contact. We don't actually know how old the, the, the deeper deposits are, but we do now know through excavations there is deeper archaeology down there and it goes quite a way. So that's another interesting component for the future. Um, this is our sort of rough uh, new stratigraphy for the site as we sort of sit at it. So we have this sort of lower unit. Um, Deacon originally called these members and he defined three of them. So we've now split this up into a number of different units. There's a basal um, sand unit, which he called the Ankara member, which we've only excavated into for the first time this season. It does have some archeology. span There's then a layer that he said was um, sterile, but we do have, there's some sporadic archeology span in there. We don't know how old that either of those units are yet. 
We then have the main unit that Deakin excavated. We've got dates of 400 and 380,000 for those units with the archaeology. And then there was another unit that um, he originally said that he thought there was um, intrusive material into it. I'm assuming because it looks, well, the material looks like it's more Middle Stone Age. But we actually have a date of about 200,000 years for that. So it actually makes sense that it's not intrusive, it's just Middle Stone Age. Um, and there is an erosional contact between those layers. There's then a big erosional unconformity, and then we have deposits that are actually like 60,000 years old. So it is, um, it's a nice, it's a stratified sequence, but there are periods of time that are completely missing. Um, what we're beginning to find though is as we excavate in different areas, we can begin to find some of those missing pieces and put it all together again, and that's a big challenge. The other beautiful thing is that Hilary Deacon was meticulous. He even piece plotted all of his artifacts uh, on graph paper. So we have X, Y, Z coordinates of all of most of his material. He eventually gave up, I assume, because he had a looming thesis deadline um, and started doing it in spits. Um, he also talks in his thesis about how he tried to do a spatial analysis, but he just couldn't do it. And someone really needed to write a, a computer program to help. Um, obviously today we have ArcGIS, we have that computer program, and so we've actually been able to input all of that material back into, take all of his 3D coordinates, put it back into a GIS, drop it back into our three-dimensional models, stick it in virtual, uh, in augmented reality so we can walk around the site and see exactly where all the material is in real space. Um, and that's the sort of thing you very rarely get with legacy data from 50 years ago. So a big thank you for Hilary Deacon and being so meticulous for his masters when he did that because it's made our life just absolutely. And we, it means we can take the collections and put them back in the ground and know how they relate to our stuff, which is always a challenge going back to old sites. As far as Deacon's thoughts on the actual archeology, span um, you know, he thought it was part of a late Acheulean phase and he was very much right about that. Um, it's quite unstandardized, large, rough implements. Other people have suggested that perhaps um, because of that, it may have been Sangoan-like. Um, some of the material looking a little bit like um, picks or core axes or core scrapers. Um, the Sangoan is not something that's talked about an awful lot about in South Africa. It's normally, if you're talking about a more transitional period, it's not normally sort of the foresmith. Um, but... Um, yeah. As far as the stone tool goes, 99% uh, of the lithics are made on quartz, quartz sites, derived from the table mountain sandstone that underlie the region. We've got some material on Silk Creek, but most of it is on quartz sites. Um, we get a lot of unworked cobbles at the sites, and we actually think that that might be why people were going to the site um, to begin with, is that there is a raw material uh, occurring there. And that's actually part of this much older what's known as the Enon formation, and it seems to have been sort of partly deflated over the region. So um, as far as the typology goes, there's a big long list there that I'm not going to go through. That's some of our excavations with sort of one of just the surface hand axes. Um, but the area one lithic assemblage displays uh, expedient core reduction, predominantly by unifacial and bifacial flaking strategies. There are a few prepared cores, perhaps 15, which all show recurrent preferential exploitation. Um, the large cutting tool sample is large for an Acheulean site in South Africa, about 13%, about 147 stone tool uh, um, LCTs. Um, there are a few retouched pieces, only four within the assemblage, so a very small percentage amount. Um, and I will say that all of this um, lithic material is done by my colleague Matt Karawana, not by me. So these are his slides that I'm reading out uh, for you here. Um, Looking at core reduction, um, about 36% unifacial, 32% bifacial, and about 16% discoidal. Flaking sequences appear to be fairly short with 30 to 40% cortical surfaces preserved on cores. Um, unifacial and bifacial cores predominate, the flaked piece assemblage, unipolar and subradial flaking strategies uh, noted with alternate rotation patterns. Edges were not flaked continuously. Um, if we look at the LCTs, hand axes are around 55%, cleavers about 20% predominate the LCT assemblage. Again, relatively short reduction sequences, primary flake scars mostly prevalent, 30 to 50% of cortical surfaces present. So we, we often talk about the Amanzi butt because most, a lot of the LCTs have cortical um, butts to them still. They haven't been worked off. Um, they appear to be sort of shaping the tips um, first. 
The hand axes are, if you compare them to other things, uniquely thick and heavy when compared to other assemblages. We've compared them mostly to things like the Cave of Hards and then the Reaputs material, some of the earliest material that's on a different raw material. Cave of Hards is probably a little bit older, maybe a similar sort of age, and is made on quartzite as well. So um, if we look at the allometric aspects of Area 1, um, so we just published this in um, a special volume in honour of John Gowlett, um, which was published through Archeo Press. So if anyone wants a copy of that, I can send them the article. It's the only one we've published to date. But ultimately there, if you look at the material, you can see that length, breadth, um, mass, thickness are all much larger than the cave of paths and reed puts. So they're very much less refined um, and tend to be very thick at their midsection. So quite different to material that's very early, but uh, or made on different material, but also stuff that might be contemporary, um, but made on similar material. Um, so we're not the first sort of people to note some of these things. Uh, going Sharon in 2007 said that the uniquely thick hand axes of Mines Springs may suggest the site was an LCT workshop. And these pieces were unfinished and abandoned. And that was very much the view that Matt and I, when we were walking around the site, got very quickly sort of like, oh, that looks like a hand axe that's sort of been abandoned partway through. Um, if true, the unique thickness of the Mounsey hand axes may represent failures during thinning processes that resulted in early discard. We often look at them and go, ah, oh, that person's over thinned it. I like to think that these hominids were sat there trying to make these hand axes. They over thin it after trying to get in part way through, get very frustrated and throw it into the sort of spring. And that's why we sort of have it in some cases. How the material actually ends up in these layers is something we're still working on. We get material that's quite weathered in some layers and stuff that is like it has been um, napped the day before in other layers. This gives you a very good example of some very odd things. Uh, so this is a one that um, Hilary Deacon referred to as a cleaver because of that sort of flat sort of top on it. But if you sort of turn this thing over, you can just see all these horrible step fractures sort of everywhere that's just chewed up one side of the hand axe. And we see these sort of um, sorts of issues in the LCT technology uh, quite a bit. Others look very, very finished and quite fresh. So um, at different layers and different sort of parts of the site. We also do find, um, so um, obviously when we're looking at older excavations, we always do wonder, was everything found? Was everything collected? Particularly the smaller material, especially if sieving wasn't uh, going on. Our excavations are very much shown that we do have very, very small stuff down to like less than a centimeter occurring at the site when we excavate. So we've got elements that seem to spread across um, the production fl phase, flaking elements, production elements, shaping elements. So we're um, certain that as that sort of continues, we'll get a much better idea of the manufacturing process going on there. Area two sort of is only, it's very, very close. It's only about sort of a 30 second walk from area one. Um, so this is uh, area two on the right hand side during excavation, but before Hillary Deacon dug his deep pit. In the middle there is Matt, uh, the day we look, went there for the first time in 2015, where you can see it was very vegetated. Um, and this is where Deacon spent most of his time. He did massive excavations um, in Area 2. Um, and it's, it's quite a complex stratigraphy in Area 2 compared to Area 1, and I'm not going to go into it in great details. I'm going to talk a little bit about the deep sounding today in the middle, where we've got layered um, Acheulean material. Cutting five has probably got one of the largest accumulations of hand axes from the site, but that's part of an ongoing PhD thesis, so I'm not going to talk too much about that um, today. Um, again, just as comparisons, there's the 1960s sort of excavations, and then this is after our deforestation. This is us having opened up his um, areas. There's cutting five uh, running up the hill, and then there's Cohen, who's doing his PhD on cutting five now. Um, in the bottom of the deep sounding, the poor boy spent two years digging that hole out. Um, so he's now continuing it for his PhD. Um, we get some other interesting elements here. So hand axes like this one on the bottom right, beautifully sharp, just like the day they were napped. Absolutely gorgeous hand axes. Um, weird and wonderful sort of large looking prepared cores. We see a lot more prepared core technology in area two. And so one of the big things we want to understand is were these springs all forming at the same time? Were they forming at different periods? And we can stack the records together to create a regional sequence. We're beginning to get a sense of that now. 
Um, this sort of compares the section from Hilary Deacon's 1970 monograph, and this is the same section after we've excavated it. So this is a series of three surfaces with the Shulian, surface three, two, and one, which, um, and we know that these are actually now uh, between probably about 523 and about 440,000. So a little bit older than area one. Area one is just a little bit younger than this. So that's sort of nice because we can sort of link and we can sort of stack the two sequences sort of together. And again, very good ages, nicely in sequence. We haven't had any inverted date, um, dates yet. Some interesting things, the earlier stuff looks sort of similar to area one, um, whereas we get a bit more prepared core material in the upper layers. Um, and then this, uh, this is cutting five. So this just shows you some of the, uh, the excavations in situ. Uh, this is actually a surface that Deacon left in situ as an open air museum. Um, and we've excavated into the step there and found these other sort of big layers of hand axes and Acheulean material. And as I say, Cohen, when he can actually get back to excavating in South Africa, will be working on that for his PhD. On the top left, you can see the variance in what might be considered hand axes. Those two were literally sat on top of each other. Um, we get big ones, we get small ones. The big ones about 26 centimeters, the small ones about seven centimeters. So high degree of variance in, um, well, I don't suppose you could call the small ones LCTs, but. Um, and then the, the final sort of um, thing, this, this, is, um, this is primarily been excavated by another PhD student of mine, Alex Blackwood who is in South Africa writing up as we speak. Um, and Area 7 wasn't excavated by Deacon originally, but we were interested in it because when Matt and I did a survey through here, we found um, Achillean hand axes, but we also found Middle Stone Age stone tools. And so we were like, oh, are these, are these together? Is this, um, do we have sort of Achillean in the Middle Stone Age? Do we have a transitional thing? Or do we find them at the same time period? So this, was a, this has been a big focus of new excavations for us in Area 7. And again, I'm not going to go into it in great detail because that's sort of Alex's thing. Um, he'll be working on publications for this going forward. Um, so this is just some sort of drone uh, surveys of our excavations. So where there's sort of on the right-hand side where you can see a whole load of sandbags and the right-hand side of what's called Sector 1, we have a spring eye. And in there we have hundreds and hundreds of pieces of wood in direct association with uh, Acheulean hand axes that um, we're working on. And then as you go further away from the spring in sector four, we've got another sort of stratigraphic sequence. And the two stratigraphic sequences are, are different, but they can actually be stacked together. Um, and they're giving us slightly different parts of the spring um, activity. So in the main sort of spring itself, this sort of, um, this, this layer uh, with the wood in it and Achillean artifacts uh, is, is again about 400,000 years. So it seems to be the same age as area one. We've got some stuff that might be about 350. Um, and then we've got middle stone age at about 190 in that section. Um, if we move, so that's the sector one area. If we move to sector four, we've got sort of a mixture of, we've got Achillean hand axes and MSA in layers that might be about, would seem to be about 250. Um, and then Middle Stone Age, sort of 160 and up. So we've certainly got layers at the bottom that are Julian. We've got layers that are Middle Stone Age at the top. Um, and we appear to have stuff in the middle that's got Middle Stone Age and um, still got um, hand axes in it. So there is a sort of idea that we will eventually, once we've sort of finished here, be able to get a sort of transition sequence through that period, which is sort of very exciting. Um, and this is sort of some pictures of some of the wood material. A lot of the wood is sort of roots, um, but there is material that does appear to be worked as well. We had a, uh, a colleague that came across from Star Car in the UK who, you know, he's worked a lot on Mesolithic work wood and he's, he, he was pretty confident that there appeared to be material that had been worked there. So we've spent most of our time just working out how to preserve it when we get it out of the ground. Um, so that wood, that work is still ongoing. Um, but that piece of wood is literally right underneath that hand axe. So you can't get a closer association between it. We've been using uh, protocols so we can do residues, etc., on this material going forward. We're doing pollen and phytoliths to try and reconstruct what we can get out of it as far as environment and species got people looking at the species of wood but we're very early on in the project in this regard so but it would be really cool we can hopefully get a really great environmental sequence along with 
the Acheulean to Middle Stone Age record there. Um, and if anyone is interested, if there's any students out there interested in a fully funded PhD scholarship, we do have one. Uh, specifically, it is working on the paleo environments and microfossils. Um, you can see some leaves preserved there in some of the sequences on the left. And this is Cohen having put a auger through a six meter auger through the area seven deposits and still not reaching the bottom. So I think we've still got a lot of work to do and a lot of cool stuff to come out of it. Um, so hopefully we'll eventually be able to sort of tie all these different elements of environment, technology, not the hominids, unfortunately, we have no fossil material from Amanzi. Um, it's the wood and the Acheulean at the site. It does seem to be predominantly interglacial periods. There is some great glacial phases. So as we date more and more, we'll be able to hopefully sort of thin these out. But we've got, you know, at least um, 350,000 years going from the Acheulean through to the Middle Stone Age at the site documented so far um, and lots more to excavate. So, so ultimately, thank you for listening. Um, this is obviously a massive series of projects with an awful lot of people. Um, you know, thank you again to Australian Research Council and National Geographic for funding us. To the University of Johannesburg, our partners that we could not do work in country without. And for all these other people all over the world um, who help bring all of this data together. So thank you, Andy. That was absolutely fantastic. The new discoveries, the paradigm shifts, and then we have to rewrite all our textbooks and rethink all our <laughs> concepts. So thank you for that. I've had, a, I've, I've, had a, I've had a lucky couple of years, I have to say. So. <laughs> 